Okay, good morning. We're going to get started with our Green Rounds um, presentation. And this morning, we have Ron Hobbs presenting. He's one of our Retina Fellows. He's the first year fellow, and he's been so great to work with from a resident perspective. It's been really awesome. And I went to the Mid-Year Forum recently and talked to some of the Oklahoma residents. And they shared with me that Ron was actually the chief chief last year, which he would be too humble to tell us but apparently he was elected the chief of the chiefs <laughs> when he was a resident. So it's a pleasure to hear from him today and he's gonna sit, talk about what to present. It is so hard to pick. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about pick today in case we couldn't get that from there. Um, thanks for having me. Um, wanted to post this picture. I love this picture. I think our own um, Jim from here took it. It's, uh, he was explaining it to me where he takes like an underexposed and overexposed picture and combines them, puts it on a tripod. And one of the things that I was just blown away with when I came and interviewed here for fellowship was just the beauty of this building. It's a, it's a gorgeous building. It's a gorgeous backdrop. I think everyone who comes here is kind of first blown away by that and then amazed by it once they get to see the great things that are happening inside the building, of course. So I love that picture. Um, and then quickly, financial disclosures. I have none, but this is where most of my finances go here. It's probably the, the Halloween costumes. Um, so the patient is a 27-year-old female. Um, one week before presenting to us, she said she started seeing shimmering lights in her left eye. And with that, she also described this spot kind of in the center of her vision in her left eye. She states that during that week, that spot increased in size, and she felt like the vision around the area of the spot was also dim uh, in her central vision. She really denied any pain or erythema or other changes with the eye. Um, past medical history, she has a history of asthma and she has a history of migraines. In fact, the evening before we saw her, she was seen in the emergency department uh, complaining of severe headache. She said she had tunnel vision at that point, uh, dizziness, and she had difficulty speaking. Um, so she was seen by neurology there. She had an MRI, uh, which did show one small lesion in the right frontal lobe, but was questionable over whether or not that might be a small demyelinating lesion. Um, she was given the uh, migraine cocktail and her symptoms improved and so she was uh, diagnosed at that point with a complicated migraine and uh, sent home to follow up with us the next day. Uh, she had no surgical history. She does have a sister with keratoconus and she herself has mild myopia. She's a minus one and a quarter in each eye. Um, as far as a review of systems goes, she about two weeks prior it had an upper respiratory infection. Um, and then she states that over the past month, she's been having a big increase in her migraines. She states she used to have about two to three migraines a month. And this over the past month, it's been almost daily uh, with a couple times a week having nausea, vomiting, light sensitivity. Um, medications, she uses an albuterol inhaler as needed and Yasmin. And she uh, says she was recently finished oral steroids uh, for her upper respiratory infection given to her by her PCP. And then uh, no known drug allergy. So when she presented to us, vision's good in both eyes. She's 2015 in her right eye, 2020 in her left eye. And the remainder of her external exam is uh, normal in both eyes. Her anterior segment examination it also is within normal limits. There's no inflammation noted in either eye. And on her dilated fundoscopic exam on, on her first appearance, there was questionable old rare cells in the anterior vitreous. Uh, here's a picture of her right eye. Uh, it's kind of small, so I'll point out there's a questionable little hypopigmented spot there that you see. Um, maybe another one right down here. Not very, not real glaring when you first look at her right eye. Here's her left eye. Uh, much more obvious here. You see a couple of hypopigment spots here, 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 and then here. There's one up here if you look real close. 
So here they both are together, obviously more involvement of the left eye. And this is the eye she's having her symptoms in. Here's uh, infrared images. So infrared images are good uh, at showing some subtle pigmentary changes that we might have a hard time seeing with color at the slit lamp and stuff. With these images of the right eye, you can see a little more impressive, just a couple little pigmentary changes in the right eye. And then in the left eye, a similar picture that with a couple more lesions that weren't quite so obvious on the color photos. And then fundosotal fluorescence. Um, before sh describing this, I'll just run through it real quickly because I know it's kind of a new, newer images that we're using, but the way I think of fundosotal fluorescence is the retina and the underneath the retina and, and the RP we have lipofuscin that, that deposits as, as a product of breakdown of the uh, photoreceptor cells. So you'll get kind of this lipofuscin gives you a baseline hyper autofluorescence that you see, and that's kind of this, this light gray, this baseline hyper autofluorescence. So things that don't have lipofuscin will have hypo autofluorescence, such as the optic nerve, your arteries and veins, and just the way the fovea is set up, you don't get hyper autofluorescence there because of the way the pigment's absorbed. So anytime you see hypo autofluorescence other than that, such as these spots here, those would be areas where you have RPE loss. Um, so you have dead RPE cells, RPE that's very sick um, is, is what that's showing. And then areas where you have increased hypoautofluorescence, such as right here, you see this lighter band here, is areas where you have probably sick <coughs> RPE around where you have an increase in the lipofuscin deposit. So the RPE isn't working as well to clear that. You get increased lipofuscin buildup and you'll get hyperautofluorescence. So th just to have that brief review on this right eye now on this, we see maybe even a couple other spots that we didn't see uh, on the color photos at all and on the infrared. And on the left eye, same picture. You know, you start looking around and you see other little spots that show up here, which are demonstrating then these hypoautofluorescent spots are demonstrating uh, sick RPE or dead RPE. And then surrounding those areas, you see you have this hyperautofluorescence, which is showing us accumulation of lipofuscin. Um, here's the OCT from the right eye on, an, on initial presentation, and it, it looks great. There's really no abnormalities seen there. And here's the left eye. Uh, you'll notice just some subtle changes here at the level of the uh, RPE. There's a little change, there's a little indentation with some loss of the ISOS border junction just above that. And again, you can see that here right through the central cut through the, through the fovea. Red free images again show what we've seen. And here's the fluorescein angiogram of the right eye. Um, so this is the early photo, 45 seconds, three minutes, almost seven minutes. You see these early hyperfluorescent hyper spots. Um, they don't expand at all at three minutes or at seven minutes. So that's very consistent with window defects there. Uh, again, uh, dead or lost RPE, and we're seeing right through it to the fluorescein underneath in the choroid. And then the left eye, uh, early photos here and here, and then uh, three minutes here and six minutes here. And again, it just shows more spots than were clinically evident looking uh, at the patient. No leakage on these, on these areas of hyperfluorescence. They seem to, to stay the same throughout. And then ICG on the right eye. If you look carefully, you can see these couple hypo fluorescent spots uh, centrally. We, we term ICG kind of as, we break it into early, mid frames, and late frames. So early being zero to four minutes, it's, it's different than fluorescein angiogram. Mid being more four to eight to 10 minutes, and late frames kind of that after eight to 10 minutes. Uh, so in this case, um, this patient has in the early, these hyperfluorescent spots that you see in the mid frames and stays there in the late frames. And then the left eye, uh, similar picture, just more pronounced, more hypofluorescent spot centrally. Patient had a multifocal ERG performed. Um, so just quickly review, th this is the normal reference down here, the, the blue ones. You expect to see a healthy AV wave. Um, pretty good in the right eye. In the left eye, if you look close, we have some subtle changes here. But, but overall, uh, that's a pretty good multifocal ERG, not very impressive loss, but there's a little loss of a wave pattern center in the left eye, corresponding with where we're seeing those changes. Um, and then 
and here's the tone of this. Again, these are the normals you would expect down here in the bottom four. On this right eye here, you can see it's it's not the the nice toned peak you'd expect to see. That's more consistent with these spots like this with you probably lost fixation for a little bit. It would give you appearance like this, not so much that she has uh, loss there. And the left eye, actually, the eye that we see more involvement in, it looks better on both eyes there, though. Pretty stable, so not much change seen there. So differential diagnosis at this point, you know, just for the sake of being very complete, I put a lot of things on here, but uh, punctate intercoriopathy would be right on the top of our list, given her presentation, the lack of vitreous cell that we're seeing. Uh, multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis would look very similar. You would expect to see vitreous cell, but there is some debate over people if these are just as variations of the same disease process and, and maybe this is burnt out or early and we're not seeing that botrytis yet. Of course, histoplasmosis can look very, very similar without cell as well. Um, MUDES would be considered on there as well. Um, of course, you'd expect it to be unilateral, but she is a young myopic female. 25% uh, of them can be bilateral, so it's worth considering. Um, retinal pigment epitheliitis or Krill's disease would be another consideration. It can give you these creamy, um, small lesions. Uh, again, a little more common in male, two-thirds in male, but you can have a, a third of the patients presenting as females, um, and it could be an early indication of that. And diffuse subretinal fibrosis would be bilateral, and this would be early changes seen with that. Inflammatory on a systemic level then, sarcoid, you know, we're always taught can look like just about anything, so always one to consider. Um, maybe an early inflammatory disease, she would fit the right profile for a, a tinu or for inflammatory bowel or riders, maybe early changes seen with that. Infectious, I think, you know, the herpes also can look like many things. Uh, Post-viral, the Epstein-Barr virus, you can see changes like this that, that usually then resolve. These are thought to be more of uh, immuno immune complexes that deposit in the choroid that you might see after a viral illness like Epstein-Barr or cytomegalovirus or Coxsackie virus. And then septic choroiditis, you know, especially given her history of recently being on systemic steroids, perhaps she has some septic uh, MLI that were sent there, syphilis, tuberculosis. And then the masquerade ones, uh, I don't think it really looks like any of these, but for the sake of just completeness, I think you always should remember trauma when you see pigmentary changes in the retina. Um, Myopia can cause those, although she's pretty mild. And then retinal dystrophies early so can give you pigmentary changes. So her initial laboratory workup consisted of an ESR, an RPR, uh, ACE, PCD. They were all normal. And, of course, the evening before she was seen, she had this MRI brain. And as I mentioned before, it had a, a small lesion, which was a questionable demyelinating lesion in the right frontal lobe. So we called this PIC. Um, and just briefly to review PIC, um, it's an inflammatory disorder. It was first, it's only 29 years old, recently celebrated its 29th birthday after being described by, by Dr. Watsky in 1984. In his initial cohort, he described 12 patients, um, and the youngest was 16, the oldest was 40, and that's really stuck. You know, most people still kind of stick to those numbers. You see it in between those age groups. 90% uh, of the patients who you'll see with PIC are women, and in fact, um, a recent study uh, just showed that 97% of them are white women, so it's a, uh, really a, a disease of white women. And most will have a history of moderate myopia uh, with a history of a, without a history, sorry, of, of a preceding illness. And then it's considered to be less common than its uh, cousin, multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis, which, which presents very similarly but with uh, inf inflammation seen. The incidence is estimated at roughly 100 to 200 in the U.S. This is, it's a big guess. Um, this came from a study recently in, in Iowa. They went back and looked at over 16 years worth of patients that they had who presented with PIC, and they had 16 in 16 years. So they consider, considering themselves the tertiary referral center for the state of Iowa, they said, well, let's consider we get every new patient for the state of Iowa who presents with PIC, and our population is 2.6 million, and it's one out of 2.6 million per year, and they just then carried that out to the country, in which case they say, well, you get about 150 a year then in the country. Um, clinical features, the, the three main complaints you'll see are blurred vision, 
a central or a paracentral scotoma until autopsy is. Um, usually just in one eye, even though they have involvement in both eyes, usually they're just noticing it in, in the eye that's mostly involved. Um, the blurred vision, of course, would be due to clustering of lesions in the macula where they can present even with the colloidal neovascular membrane. Uh, even though the more prominent sign seen on visual field is, is enlargement of the blind spot, most people don't notice that, so they're coming in with central or paracentral scotomas just like our patient and photopsy is, uh, just like our patient. In addition, they can get these serous retinal detachments surrounding these crypt lesions as well. Uh, what you typically see are these yellow-white lesions. They'll have indistinct borders. They're at the level of the RPE or the choroid, um, <coughs> usually pretty small, around 200 microns, um, and located almost exclusively in the posterior pole. It's very rare to see them in the mid-periphery. In fact, if you see very many in the mid-periphery at all, you should question your diagnosis. Um, no vitritis, or at least very little vitritis, uh, uh, can be associated with it. Bilateral and 80% and usually asymmetric. Uh, at the initial presentation, often you'll see a hyperemic optic nerve. Um, and then as these progress, you'll be left with this atrophic scar with the halo surrounding the scar. And you know, uh, what I put down here is these choroidal neovascular membranes are associated in 30 to 75%. Most people will say around 40 to 50%, but there's just so many different numbers that have been found in different studies. So test what you expect to see on our patient um, is quite of a classic presentation, early, hyper early hyperfluorescence, and then you can have variable leakage or, st or staining associated with that depending on the presence of neovascular membranes. Um, and then often you'll see m many more lesions than you can see on exam with it. And I, th I thought our left eye was a great example of that. You can see a lot of lesions there that weren't obvious on the color photos. On ICG, you'll get these hypofluorescent lesions, um, which is thought to correspond with hypoperfusion of the choroid and mostly involving the small choroidal vessels. And then on the OCT, this really just starting to get a picture of this, and I'll, I'll talk about one study that they try to describe classic changes in tick, but you get kind of this hom homogenous um, thickening of these choroidal retinal lesions, and you'll get deposits of a hyperreflective material between the RPE and, uh, sorry, underneath the RPE and, and Brooks membrane, and, and it can also cause changes in the outer retinal layer. Um, and then you can have defects in Brooks membrane and loss Classically, you'll see loss of the ISOS junction during the active phase, and then that seems to reappear as the, as the active phase calms down. AMSA grid can be helpful as well, uh, showing some scotomas, and then uh, visual field. Uh, most often, you'll see enlargement of the blind spot or temporal visual field loss surrounding the, uh, the optic nerve, but you can also get central and paracentral scotomas. So the etiology of tick. Uh, remains unclear. It has been linked to HLA-DR2, like uh, multiple sclerosis and some other eye diseases as well, but it's a, it's a pretty weak link. Um, some people have questioned if it's just a variant of multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis, uh, since they're very similar, maybe just a little different presentation of the same disease, and some question if it's just associated with a myopic degeneration. In fact, in Watsky's original um, cohort, the myopia ranged from minus three and a quarter to minus 10. So they were all um, quite myopic. Um, and then, of course, another thought has been that it's just an inflammatory or an infectious thrombosis. So similar to histoplasmosis, it's, it's, it's the same process. We just don't know uh, what the bug is that's causing it yet, and, and we'll figure that out and then be able to link it. Um, those who, so the, the link to Epstein-Barr virus has been proposed as well. Uh, Tiedemann back in, 1987, he did a study and showed that 10 patients with multifocal choroiditis had uh, high IgM titus repsin bar virus, and so that you'll still hear that today um, in the literature quite a bit. But a couple studies since that point, and one of my cited here was by Spade. Since that point, it has not found that same finding, so it's, it's been re rather debunked uh, a couple times since then, and so uh, not considered quite as much. Um, this was a study that was done recently in the United Kingdom I thought was interesting. So they, they're trying to show the link between tick and MCP. And so what they did is they took 61 patients who had MCP or tick and they compared them to 92 population controls in the, in the UK. 
and they were looking at uh, 12 polymorphisms between the TNF alpha and the IL-10, um, which is a region which is associated with a lot of UVI. This IL-10 has, has recently been shown to <coughs> be associated in a high, to have a high correlation with uveitis. So what they show, they show two conclusions that contradict themselves a little bit. The first was they said that there's clear differences in the clinical course between patients with MCP and PIT um, and, in, and in the prognostic significance. So they said the MCP patients usually have a more non-remitting course that continues on and they require higher levels of immunosuppression to try to keep the disease down. So in that case, they said they're quite different. But then at the same time, they said that the patients had identical IL-10 and TNF haplotypes between the MCP and the PIT patients when compared to the, the general population. So again, supports the thought that, that these diseases are, are very closely linked and maybe that, that PIT just happens to be a less aggressive uh, form of the same disease and that's why we get less uh, detritus. to each other between MCP and PIT. Okay. So they're, they're identical. Yes? So when they say they're identical, does that mean that they're not consistent with one That's a good question. What they And they were vague on this one. I, I tried to look at it and see, are they saying that's a statistical significant difference between the two of them? And they didn't say that. What they, the way they worded it was they said, well, the, the, they're identical. And so I, I don't have a better answer for you on that. Okay. is relatively small. It, the problem is, you know, it's, it's hard to get 61 patients anywhere with yeah, the, the, yeah, that's the, that's by far the, the biggest one I could find of, of any of them, you know, so, but, but yeah. Definitely. Um, a recent study that was put out this end of last year also talked, trying to identify uh, typical lesions on OCT. So <coughs> they looked, this was out of Wilmer, they took seven patients, um, six females, one male, and they looked at 27 PIC lesions located in those patients, and they tried to classify OCT changes you would see between active and non-active lesions. So they characterized them as active if the patient had either a visual disturbance, if the lesions of the border were changing, or they could see edema surrounding the lesion, <coughs> or if there was hyperfluorescence on fluorescein angiogram. So they had pretty strict criteria for what was active. And, and so using that criteria, they said 24 out of the 27 lesions all showed involvement of the RPE. And one of the interesting things that they found from it was they could only show one lesion that had involvement of the choriocapillaris on OCT, <coughs> even though we hypothesized that that's the choroid and the choroid capillaris are, are what's involved with this. Um, and so, and just an interesting tidbit. Um, so what they, the ones that they deemed clinically stable by using this criteria then, um, they, they, they found two main patterns noted on OCT. One was they'd have this RPE elevation with sub-RPE hyperreflective signals, and I'll show you some pictures of this. And then on another one, they had no RPE elevation, but they had disruption of the outer retinal layers. 
Um, and one other interesting tidbit was of those that they called clinically stable, seven of those lesions uh, demonstrated alteration. So they could show that the, the lesions were actually getting bigger and smaller during this time, even though they couldn't show that the, the lesions were active by forcing the angiogram or by patient noticing changes. And then of those that were clinically active, uh, the main other finding they had was that the photoreceptor cells, this ISOS junction, uh, would not be visible during active disease. And then as it, things settled down, that, that junction usually came back into view where you could see it again. And I'll show you some examples. So here's some clinically inactive. And this is baseline here, and these are the months. So here's three months and four months on patient, right, this lesion number six. So here's our, our arrow of where we're going through, and you see it baseline, flat area, looks pretty routine. And this is, a, again, an inactive patient. At three months, you come in and you have this hyperreflective sub-RPE material, and you can see Brooks' membrane here runs contiguous, it stayed intact. The patient comes back a month later, that's flattened back out. And here's your ISOS junction, you have it run here and here, but you lose it during this phase of, of this material deposit. Comes back a month later, ISOS junction looks good and things have settled down. And this is in a patient who really had no symptoms. Again, a, a just a similar pic, another patient here, lesion seven, but you, you get the same picture. Again, this hyperreflective sub-RPE material flattens out. Um, ISOS junction looks much better when it flattens out. Uh, patient never had any, any idea that anything was going on. And then here's some that were clinically active, and, and really the appearance is very similar. So it, it leads to a question of what's, what's active and what's not, I think. But here's a patient, lesion 14 at baseline, a pretty smooth running RPE here. Come back one month later, they now have some hyperreflective material deposited beneath the RPE. 20 months later, it's gone. And then this one, this patient right here, lesion 27, a similar appearance, but it also correlates with these photos right here. It's the same patient. So you see a color photo of, of the spot we're talking about, and then an early fluorescein angiogram and a late fluorescein angiogram. And they argue it's active because you get a little bit of late leakage around it on the late fluorescein angiogram, but obviously not much leakage, so not much activity um, going on there. One other uh, interesting case, this was a patient who had originally presented and had anti-VEGF treatment given, responded initially, and then had a recurrence. So she has this colloidal neovascular membrane you can see right here, and with further anti-VEGF didn't have any response. So they went in and surgically removed that colloidal neovascular membrane. Here she is a month out, out from surgery, and here she is a year later. You can see there they bought a new OCT machine in the, in the meantime. But she looks great. Um, I think they wanted to show off the surgery a little bit at the same time, toot their own horn. But um, the main finding that came from it was it was helpful because it gave us our first look, our first chance to use light and electron microscopy to look at one of the of the um, colloidal neovascular membranes associated with PET. And I know Dr. Mamos is probably the only one in here who looks at this and thinks it makes sense. You don't but do that. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. Well, good, because that's what it looks like to me. But I'll explain to you what what the, they were explaining in the chart, but they're showing this is the pigment epithelial layer here, and uh, this is your Brooks membrane. And so beneath it, this is the main picture they, they were interested in, but beneath it in the choroid level, they're showing these lymphocytes. And so they're saying this supports the hypothesis that this is an inflammatory process involving the choroid, even though on the OCT we're not seeing much choroidal change. Um, so management of PIC, I, I think PIC, really has a lot of interesting management uh, questions. And so most, first of all, most patients don't require treatment unless they have uh, involvement in the other eye with vision loss or unless they have a choroidal neovascular membrane that develops. Most of them do well unless, unless that happens, but obviously about half of them have that happen. Um, so treatment options, there's a lot. Since this is more of an inflammatory disease, one of the best treatment options is systemic steroids. So these are a couple different case series, small case series, and a case report. There's not, there are not big numbers to look at on this. Um, this first one was from Brown um, out of Iowa. They went back and looked at some of their patients, and so they said, well, we've treated four patients with PIC with, our, with either oral or subtenon steroids, and three of the four didn't have any improvement of their choroidal neovascular membrane. That was one of the, f the very first studies to come out talking about treating it with steroids. Two years later then, out of United Kingdom came this study, and, and it really changed the way we treat it because they said, well, we took 12 eyes that had these subfovial neovascular membranes from PIC, 
and we put them on oral prednisone at a big dose, you know, 60 to 80 milligrams, and they started a wean after that. And they said uh, 10 of the 12 eyes had improved or stabilized vision after that, and nine of them had resolution <coughs> of leakage on fluorescein in the angiogram, and three of them had improvement. So all of them had some improvement, nine of them had completely stopped. And then of those four patients ended up needing more steroids. So that really changed the way PICK was treated at that point. And then Levy, um, just another one in 2005, showed another patient who had vision of 660, which improved to 69 um, with treatment of oral steroids. And he noticed that the, the lesions in the posterior pole became much smaller and the, the leakage stopped on fluorescein angiogram. Another treatment option then is intravitreal steroids, trying to get it just that medicine right for the, the area of the inflammation. Olacan, this is the only study I could find that he, he's the only one I could find that's used a Redisert device for PIC. So he put it in saying, well, this is a long disease and we'll put it in and for 36 months they'll have coverage. Um, so he put one in on a patient and they ended up having a relapse of, of coronal vascular membrane in eight months in and had PDT, which was successful, but it didn't stop recurrent uh, neovascular membranes from developing. And then Sin did a study where he talked about using intravitreal triamcinolone on, on a couple different patients who were pregnant and had um, good results. One stabilized, one the vision improved substantially. Uh, PDT and steroids probably up until a few years ago were probably recognized as the main treatment option. Um, PIC lesions, PIC neovascular membranes seem to be quite responsive to PDT. Uh, this was a study that was published in Retina in 2008, um, probably right at the time when VEGF started to really overtake PDT for the treatment of this. But they had 14 eyes uh, followed over a 12-month period who were given both triam intravitreal triamcinolone and PDT, and they had a, a substantial improvement in the best corrected visual acuity from logmar from 0.52 to 0.2 at a year, one-year follow-up. Many studies supporting that. And then anti-VEGF in the last few years has been kind of the main treatment we've seen. This was the largest cohort I could find. It came out of China, but they had uh, a lot of people in China, so probably more PIC, but they, they took um, 12 patients, which I thought was interesting you know, as a side note, just because they say 97% of, of the, the treatment was uh, Caucasians, but in China he had a cohort of 12 uh, diagnosed with PIC, and so uh, he either gave them, he gave them a bevacizumab, and they came back if they had any recurrent activity or leakage. Um, and they were all followed for 12 months. And he had an improvement in baseline corrected vision from 2062 to 2034. And all eyes, he said, had stabilized or and improved. Um, nine eyes had showed greater than two lines of improvement in vision. And, and one other interesting thing, he said all lesions had converted to this kind of cicatricial phase after 12 months. It wasn't just. Uh, it, it, it varied per, per patient. So when they came back, if they were considered to have continued activity, they received more. So every patient was different, but at 12 months followed, they were followed monthly. And if they had fluid on OCT or they had leakage on FA, they were given another injection. So, so the improvement is just the actual amount of Yes. But they, again, they only have 12 months of follow-up, so it's hard to read too much into that. And then immunomodulation, Trigger Wu in uh, uh, Wilmer has recently started treating most of his PIC patients with uh, CELSEP. And so I thought this was an interesting study, but he had, um, he showed eight patients who he'd followed who had at least two recurrent episodes in the previous 12 months and had 12 months of follow-up prior to start being started on CELSEP and 12 months of follow-up after. And so of these patients, they experienced 19 attacks of recurrent disease. I think the main point on this slide um, during mycophenolate mofetil therapy, the main point though was the, the attack frequency. So before being treated, they had about 1.09 attacks per year per patient. Uh, and after treatment, it decreased about four times to 0.23. Um, and that's with the year of follow-up on, on cell set. So. Uh, he's a big proponent of treating them with immunomodulation to try to slow this down. So here's our patient, back to her. She returns three months later. Um, her headaches continue to worsen, and now she has this constant flashing lights in the left eye. Uh, she did have gallbladder surgery two weeks prior and felt like that just sped everything up. Um, she also complains of more metamorphopsia and more darkening in the left eye. Uh, vision has decreased now in that left eye to 20-50, and the remainder of the exam is normal. 
and here's their color photo, you can see quite a bit more um, hypopigmented lesions over there in that left eye compared to previous. And here's her fundus autofluorescence. I'll point out, so here's her when she came in the first visit and here's three months later. You'll notice just a, a dramatic increase in the hypo autofluorescence spots and also in the hyper autofluorescence surrounding that. Definite advancement. The right eye really looks pretty darn stable. Again, 14 angiogram in the right eye, no change. And in the left eye, now you have uh, additional lesions here. Questionable if there might have been a little bit of leakage here, but we didn't think we didn't think so at that point. ICG in the right eye is unchanged except for hypofluorescent spots, and in the left eye, much more dramatic change noticed. OCT again looks great in the right eye. Now in the left eye, you see these um, sub RPE hyperfluorescent uh, spots, hyperreflective deposits, I should say. Visual field at that point shows just enlargement of the blind spot and temporal um, loss in the left eye. So at that point, she gets a more thorough workup. She has a lumbar puncture done. It's normal. She started on oral prednisone after doing these other studies. Her monoclonal goal was negative. Bartonella's were negative. She had Epstein-Barr vi Epstein virus titers drawn. The IgG was high, which is interesting, quite high, but the IgM's low, so not much to make of there. The rest of the workup was negative. So she started on oral prednisone, uh, 60 milligrams. She comes back six weeks later. She's feeling a little better. Vision's a little better in that left eye. She still has that gray spot in the center of her vision, but it's better, she thinks, and uh, some photophobia. Vision's improved. So last time she was 20-50 in that left eye. Now she's back down to the, getting the 20-20 line, and she's, she has this definite central scotoma on, on fields in the left eye. So here you can see a prior visit, and now today, six weeks later, you can see that those uh, hypopigmented spots have kind of settled down. Things look a little more stable in that left eye. And on the fundus autofluorescence, you probably see the most impressive uh, documentation of that. You can see just how that hyper and hypoautofluorescence has improved dramatically there with the oral steroids in the left eye. The right eye really has remained, un remained the same. At this point, though, when we look at her fluorescein angiogram in the left eye. Uh, she Here's early, and here she has this continued hyperfluorescence that, that seems to extend a little bit centrally there. ICG really is, I think, is imp impressive in the left eye how much better it looks. So here it is today, and here it was the visit before. So quite an, an, an improvement on those hypofluorescent spots. OCT stable in the right eye again, and, and much improved in the left eye. So we continue her at the prednisone wean. She's now down to 40. And at that point, she gets an AVAS in the left eye because we were concerned about that hyperfluorescence uh, in the left eye there on the fluorescein angiogram. I think uh, one other thing I wanted to show was just on the, the ICG. You see it, it, again, a concern there. Maybe there's some hyperfluorescence late, and which would be consistent with a, a neovascular membrane. So she comes back another six weeks later. Vision continues to improve. Uh, mainly, she's just getting some symptoms now from the steroids. So she has ulcer and anxiety. She has new cold sores, but she's doing great. So we're not ready to stop, and we're gonna we're gonna push ahead. Uh, Vision-wise, she's 20/20. We're all thrilled. Um, and I'll just tell you, this looks the same as before. There's no change. Fundus autofluorescence. You do see some more spots here, though. Now, you know, you look at it, and you could say, well, we're seeing some some early changes. Um, fluorescein angiogram. There's no more leakage. We were concerned about this little area right here that we thought was leaking before. That's definitely not leaking on here. OCT um, continues to look better. So we continue the wean. We start her on valsite for the ulcer for the um, cold sores and and plug ahead. Six weeks again. She's still doing well. She's down to 10 on the prednisone. Uh, things look pretty much the same. So we're going to keep following her comes back six weeks later, vision's down a little bit. She says, I feel fine, but we're, we can only get her to 2040. And now she's pregnant. And this is what Dr. Vitali's head did when he heard that. <laughs> he said, you gotta be kidding me. Um, so the game changes a little bit. Uh, really on the fundus autofluorescence, again, you know, even though she's down a little bit, we, 
subtle changes, but they're not much different, you know, and so you start debating how, how aggressive do we be. She's off all steroids. We say, let's watch you. Come back in six more weeks. We'll take another look. Um, so she comes back six weeks. Um, now she feels she's much worse. Vision color changes are, are bad. Um, she's a college student. She says, I can't do my work because I can't see to read, and, and my head hurts all the time, and I'm 11 weeks pregnant. Um, Vision-wise, she's down in both eyes. Now she's 2040 minus in the right, 2060 minus in the left. Um, and now she's got kind of bilateral central scotoma. She's describing on AMSA. And, uh, and here's her fundosaudal fluorescence. So in the right eye, you can see that these hypopigmented areas, which correspond to RP dropout, and are much darker. And you see this hyperautofluorescent area here, which we haven't been seeing before in the right eye, which is six RPE. And then in the left eye, you can really see this sick RPE centrally right here in the fovea, some expansion of these spots. She's doing worse. OCT, here's her right eye. This is the first time we're starting to see changes. And this, I think this is a great photo that describes some of these outer, outer retinal layer changes that you see described with active disease in, in the, the one paper I cited. And then the left eye, again, you have these sub RPE hyperreflective deposits bigger now than they've been ever. So we have a long talk with her because she's pregnant and so th that really changes some of our options and, and what we recommend is intravitreal triamcinolone, triessens. Um, we tell her we think this is very safe with your pregnancy. We put the medicine right where we want it. Um, she comes back four weeks after that and really feels like she's doing a lot better. Uh, she's 15 weeks pregnant at this point. Vision has gone from 2040 back to 2020 in the right eye, and vision has gone from 2060 minus to 2040 plus in the left eye. So, so we're pleased with that. Um, Fundosaudal fluorescence, we see uh, some improvement. These, these lesions here are smaller again, and this here is, does look better. It's, it's quieting down. Here's her OCT, really. You just have that spot that was there before is gone, and she has just kind of a loss of her ISOS junction right there and down here. And these are settling down here in the left eye. They're smaller than they were. So we say, well, let's, we've got the triacin in. Let's see you back in four weeks. The frustrating thing was she comes in and she's very tearful at this point. She says, I saw you guys. You gave me the triacin. You told me it was pretty safe. I went to my OBGYN a couple days later, and he tells me it's class D, and there's a very good chance my baby's going to have problems now. And she's sobbing. And so just what you didn't want. Um, so, you know, I, I want, uh, just an interesting side note, triamcinolone and acetaminide is, is pre pregnancy category C. Triessence is just the exact same thing minus the preservative, yet in everything I can find it's listed as pregnancy category D, which I'm sure is what her OBGYN looked up and, and told her all of this with. Do you know why that is? No. I, I, was, I briefly just put the drug categories on. I won't go through them for you, but in study C, you know, studies in animals have revealed adverse effects. In study B, they say there's positive evidence of, hum, of human fetal risk. And, and so the risk with steroids, we all know, is, is cleft palate in, in, in fetuses. But so we pull up this study. We had a conversation with her OBGYN about it to try to prevent further problems. But this is the only study really that, that goes into this. It was done in 2004. But what they did was they took 20 consecutive patients, and after giving them whopping doses of intravitreal triamcinolone, 20 to 25 milligrams, we don't really do that anymore, they, uh, they drew their blood and they checked the serum levels with triamcinolone. The, the problem was it wasn't done perfectly, so they, they drew it at 13 plus or minus 19 days after. So this was not the, the best design study. It ranged from 4 to 92 days. But in 18 of those eyes, 90%, they couldn't find any triamcinolone in the serum. In 10%, two of the 20 patients, they found, these were samples taken at five and seven days, they found 0 0.5 micrograms and 0 0.8 micrograms, which is just nothing, you know. That, that, 
when you consider that our average daily production of cortisol is about 15 to 20 milligrams, even though this is four to five times stronger than that, it, it, it adds up to nothing from what we make. And so we tried to reassure her. She's not really hearing it very well. She's saying, well, I won't do another injection. I'll go blind before I let you. Yeah, and so anyway, just a point on that. It should be quite safe. I just wanted to make that point, you know, and we made that with her and, and sent a nice letter to her OBGYN informing him of that, but, but that bri bridge was burnt at that point. Um, and then another thought on anti-VEGF. I, I wanted to briefly touch on this in pregnancy. So this came out of Karen Tola, one of the retina doctors in, in Iowa, came out with this, but uh, in 2010. So they, um, they took four patients who had, a, of those four patients, they had a total of five pregnancies. And these four patients, they treated with a total of 13 injections of Avastin during their pregnancy. Um, two were treated during the first trimester. And one woman, in fact, had three injections given during the first trimester. Um, and then two were treated second trimester. One was just third. And then they also had a patient who got five injections while breastfeeding. And so they, they said, well, we did this in five patients. We had no event, adverse events. But as we all know, that's a very small number. Yeah, it's, it's they published it, but no one feels comfortable now giving Avastin after having seen this. Um, one other thought, I, I thought it was interesting they used Avastin. So I, I did quite a bit of reading on this, but um, most small drugs cross the placenta by simple diffusion. So bigger drugs have to be carried across by active transport. So the, the classic example they always use is insulin, which is 5.8 kilodaltons. It has, it has to be actively transported across the placenta to the fetus. So Avastin is 149 kilodaltons, much bigger. Even, even Lucentis is 48 kilodaltons. Um, and then the other way that fetuses obtain these antibodies is by an FC receptor that binds the FC portion of the IgG. So it, it makes a lot of sense that, a, that Lucentis would be much safer because they've removed that FC portion from, from the molecule, whereas Avastin still has that FC portion. Of course, there's no study that's been done on this to show the levels that cross the, the fetus, but, but just theorizing on it would make sense that Lucentis would be much less likely to cross. It is a little bit smaller, but it's still much bigger than insulin, and it doesn't have that FC portion to help carry it across. Um, and then one other study I wanted to cite here was just by Petri. This came out of Italy. I thought it was really interesting. So they unknowingly um, gave uh, a Vastin injection to two women who were pregnant. That both women, one was four weeks pregnant, one was five weeks pregnant at the time of injection and were not aware of it. Both women then had uh, spontaneous abortions one week after the injection of a Vastin. And so, again, it's all anecdotal, but this is just the other study we have that, that's been reported on this. No, it doesn't, doesn't tell us much. Because uh, then you have this question. This was the other one I cited. Wilcox in England Journal of Medicine in 88 said, you know, the incidence of spontaneous early abortion is 31%. So it's hard to read much into any of this. But um, One last, a couple last studies I wanted to, to mention. Um, just the levels that we see change with, with Avastin injections in the eye. So this was one where they gave Avastin injections in the eye in patients with type 2 diabetes and then 30 non-diabetic control patients. And then they sampled the blood for serum VEGF levels at one day, seven days, and 30 days after the injection. So the average, average, the average VEGF level before was 114. At day one, it was 9.7 after the injection, 11.7, 25.9. So they had a substantial decrease in serum VEGF levels. Correct, I'm sorry. It was part of the 114. I don't know. I don't know what it was after. I didn't. I didn't write that. I don't remember. I'm sorry. But this other study kind of did the same thing. I think it was a little bit better done, and it was just published this month, actually. But um, they took 30 diabetic, 30 AMD patients, and they randomized them to 10 Lucentis, 10 Avastin, 10 Matrogen, which I thought that was a dinosaur, but they did, and then. Um, so here, the, here are the diabetes patients. At baseline, 72. This is the, the serum VEGF levels again. So 72.2. Uh, day 7 is 13.7. Day 30, 17. Dr dramatic, uh, highly significant difference in the serum VEGF levels after injection. Whereas in the Lucentis and in the Macrogen levels, 
the, the change was, was non-significant. They couldn't show a difference. So I thought that was the better done study, but uh, again, showing that a dramatic decrease in serum bed death levels associated with avastin. One other question that came up in her, you, you know if it's safe to use fluorescein angiography during pregnancy? It's kind of a trick question because no one knows. Um, <laughs> it's like everything in medicine, no one tests it. So uh, the only study we have. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So the, the only information we really have came from this study in 1990. They sent out 399 retina specialists a questionnaire saying, have you used fluorescein angiogram? 309 said no, 77%, and uh, 90 said yes, they had. So then they wanted to know what results did you see of that. So of the 90 or the 22% who had used it, they got detailed information on 116 patients. The main side effects were nausea, vomiting, as you would expect with fluorescein angiogram. Birth anomalies, they had, of those 116, they had one undescended testicle, one syndactyly. And then they went, and then further broke it down to 41 of the 116 had the FA performed in the first trimester. So of those 41, they had four deaths at 10%. Two were thought to be due to severe eclampsia. One was months later. They didn't think it was related to that at all, but it's, it's hard to know. And then one occurred three days later in a healthy woman who was four weeks pregnant. So the authors of this study, they also pointed out eight children were born to mothers with eclampsia, had birth weight, low birth weights of the 116. And then with that information, they said, well, we conclude that fluorescein angiogram does not cause a high rate of birth anomalies or complications. So uh, that's really been challenged, and, and that study, their conclusion they made is where, what, what got them in trouble. Um, people have had a, a big problem with them saying that from, from that one study. Um, anyway, uh, so she comes back now four weeks later again, and she's doing much better. She's 2015, she's 2025 plus in the left eye. Um, small, small central scotoma in the left eye, but, but doing better than she had been. Forcing it, uh, sorry, fundus autofluorescence is pretty stable. She continues to look a little better. OCP in the right eye, again, you have this little ISOS loss, but that does look better than it was before. And these are continuing to settle down. That's all. <laughs> this is why you don't let your kids watch Nacho Libre in case you wanted to know. And then, but questions at all about I Nothing that I saw, you know, the only things I saw that were interesting with her was most authors speculated that pregnancy would kind of be immunosuppressive and, and decrease the flare-up of tick. There were two case reports I saw, individual case reports of patients who had ticks who had flare-ups during pregnancy, much like our patient, but um, nothing regarding eosinophils themselves directly. go back and look on her and saw it because she did do a couple CBC scans. Yeah. Well, you also mentioned the fact that the ICD suggesting that this may occur with that early cluster of cases as well as the CBC. What do you mean by that? Is it just a coincidence or is there some other reason for that? Yeah. I think most people agree it's, there's definitely involvement there. We're just not seeing it. 